All of today's readings have some connection to either light or to vision, or in the gospel reading, we see that it's both, right? In the gospel reading, Jesus performs a miracle. In John's gospel, a miracle is not called a miracle, it's called a sign. And each of Jesus's miracles reveals something about who Jesus is and his true identity. And so today, that revelation by giving the blind man who was born blind his sight is that Jesus is the light of the world, right? The light that has come into the world. Paul takes that idea saying that we were once darkness, but now we are light in Christ, right? That we are now also that light. And in the first reading, we hear about the selection of um, David as the king to be anointed to become king. And God says not, or, uh, you know, it's said about God that it's not by human standards. God does not see the way humans see, but as God sees, because human beings look at the appearance of something, but God sees into the heart, right? That God sees into the heart, and that's how David was selected or chosen by God, by that view into the heart. So in the gospel reading, uh, we have this idea both of light and of vision, this idea that we are called to see, and that it is more than just a literal healing of someone born blind, even as Jesus makes clear at the end when he's talking about the blindness of the Pharisees, that there is a deep and rich symbolic meaning to that. And in fact, when we often colloquially, colloquially say, oh, I see, we mean we understand. We mean we have a comprehension of reality in some way that would not be normal. Many of you know that I was served in the U.S. Air Force, and I was an intelligence officer. Specifically, I was an intelligence applications officer, so I analyzed information. I didn't collect it. I analyzed it, and then I presented it to decision makers so they could make good decisions based upon a perception of reality. In specific, I had advanced training in target intelligence. So that training included being able to analyze target systems and determine critical nodes, and so also being able to determine the appropriate application of force to achieve certain goals. So do you want to take out a communication system? Do you want to do that for 24 hours or forever, right? And how much force do you need to apply to do that? As part of that training, we were down in Texas, and part of that training, which was very interesting, uh, we went to a lot of the places that we would later analyze and try to figure out what the critical nodes of different target systems were. So one of those, we went, we went to a, a construction project on a highway. And so the engineers are there. They came out to meet us. It was a special request from the Air Force. And so we, who were learning how to destroy bridges, were talking to people who built bridges. And so we had a conversation around their structure and how they work and how they function and all those kinds of things. And at one point I asked, well, if you wanted to destroy this bridge, where would you hit it? They did not comprehend the question. They did not see what I saw. They didn't recognize the purpose, right? When I was thinking disrupting a logistics system or transportation system, they are thinking, how do I keep this bridge standing? not how do I take it down. We saw reality, and our communication broke down, we saw reality from different perspectives, right? It is important for us as disciples of Jesus to have an accurate view of reality. In this Lenten season, as we approach those celebration of the, the Easter sacraments, of baptism in particular, what is the vision that we have? What is the light that opens our hearts and our minds to reality as it truly is? that helps us to navigate our lives, our relationships, our decisions most clearly. Jesus is the light of the world. It is his light that becomes the determining factor, the frame of reference, the perceptive lens by which we view reality. There are many competitions to that in our world. We see uh, many even within our own hearts, the, the place where we are truly ourselves, where we are with God in our true identity, we have oftentimes barricades or obstacles to trying to see with the light of Christ. And that light really is love, right? It is the light of love. It is the foundation of all reality. It is the way God has created, why God created the whole universe, why he created you and me, and the destination that we're all meant for, right? We're all intended to live with God in love forever. That we're, that's where God, God 
did not want to have heaven without us, right? He sent his son for us. He brought us into his life. And that is the lens by which he desires for us to see reality. But there are some obstacles to that. And I think uh, the beautifully read by Deacon Mark, the long gospel reading, and, and by the way, we often have options for longer or shorter versions of the gospel reading. If I'm presiding and they ask me what I want, I almost always say the long version. You're welcome. <laughs> the long version. I, I like us to hear as much of it as we can in full context so that something may speak to you or to me that's not present in the shorter version, right? So we hear the longer version, and I just want to highlight three things out of the longer version and the interactions that different characters have in the story about how some of those obstacles in our hearts are there. I think the first is really about the disciples. As Jesus notices the man in his suffering, the blind man on the side of the road, his disciples ask him, Lord, who sinned? This man or his parents? Notice in the way that they ask the question, they don't leave another option. They don't leave another option. Their perceptive lens is around the morality of actions and their parents or that, or the man born blind and the resultant consequences of his blindness, right? It is important for us, this is a parenthetical note, but it's an important note that Jesus disassociates physical ailment from retribution for sin. It's not his responsibility and it's not his parents' responsibility. Those with this physical disabilities have value and worth and are not blamed for those ailments. Right? We see them as being in the image and likeness of God. Jesus saw the blind man not as being outcast or on the side of, of society, but as loved by God. And he chooses to draw him back into that full communion and community, to give him back his sight. So we often recognize that value and dignity of everyone in all of their differences. And we, we honor and celebrate some of those differences. So, but the disciples... Really, they are ignorant. They're ignorant. They do not have a lens and are not interested in a lens that views it differently than what they had been taught, that tries to see reality differently. In our own lives, oftentimes we do not foster a curiosity about, uh, foster a curiosity about learning the truth, right? We are comfortable in our opinions, or we're comfortable in what has been handed on to us or what has been taught to us, but we are there and we become static, right? We are happy in our ignorance. We're not seeking the truth. In this Lenten journey, in this Lenten season, I think the antidote for that is to be open, to desire to know more fully what is Jesus' teaching? What do the scriptures say? Let's always read the long version, right? Let's always seek more and more knowledge and learning, be lifelong learners and continuously on the journey of growth. We're not in our ignorance happy and trying to just perceive and be content with reality as it is. We know that God desires a change for us. In the second instance, what I'd like to talk about is where um, the Pharisees, having now indicated that the man, they've met the man born blind the first time, um, probably the second interaction where he gets to tell this story, but it's the first time the Pharisees are talking to him, and it is revealed that Jesus broke the law of the Sabbath, right? The second obstacle in our hearts after ignorance is often legalism. Legalism that often stems from a hardness of heart, but a legalism that places the law above the purpose of the law. Right, that looks at the rules or regulations more than about the value of those for the people that they serve. The Sabbath was intended by God to give rest, life, restoration to God's people, to all of humanity, right? What the Pharisees did instead was made it a burden. It, they made it harder to live the Sabbath. They didn't see that the purpose behind Jesus' action was the intention of the Sabbath. Instead, they wanted to critique cut down, destroy that which violated the law in our own hearts where we should be instead of legalism, 
is in compassion and mercy, right? God tempers his justice with his mercy. He gives us his forgiveness. He calls us to himself. And on the journey of Lent, again, we are each called to respond to that gift of God's grace for us, to be open to seeing how God sees things and seeing the purpose behind the law. So we kind of eschew legalism and move into God's mercy and compassion. The third interaction is right before the Pharisees kick the guy out of the synagogue, right? Before they kick him out. And uh, they are having discussed with him several things and then they, they bring up a point about the Sabbath again and then he, you know, he's responding to them and he, he says, this is amazing. We know that nobody listens to sinners or God doesn't listen to sinners, but only to, to devout and righteous people. And, and if this guy were a sinner, then you know, God wouldn't listen to him kind of thing. And their response to that was, you were born totally in sin. Who are you to tell us, to teach us? Pride is the third obstacle. Pride in ourselves, pride in our tradition, pride in our opinions, pride, 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 pride. Pride hinders our ability to see. It keeps us self-centered and self-focused, right? It limits our ability to be humble, to open ourselves up to truth, to mystery, to love. And so in our Lenten journey, we open ourselves with the first step of humility, to recognize that we are in need of the light. I'll say that again. We are in need of the light. We ourselves are not the light, right? Even though many of us, myself included, often think so. We are in need of Christ's light. On this Lenten journey, may we humbly come before God, ready to receive his mercy and his love, ready to be open to the truth that he gives to us. And may we each take our next best step with Christ as disciples, as learners, as those who walk in the footsteps of Jesus. The light has shone in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. May our hearts, through this Eucharist, be illuminated once more. Uh, first thing, I just wanted to make an addendum to the homily. Um, it took me a couple decades until I stopped looking at bridges the same way. 